Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Craig Simpson. He's one of the legends of direct response marketing and copywriting. Craig has mailed over 200 million sales pieces. He's grossed hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue for him and his clients over the past 15 years. Some of his clients include P90X, Pet Supplies Plus, Dan Kennedy, Frank Kern, and many more. Craig is the co-author of a book with Dan Kennedy called The Direct Mail Solution, and one of my favorite subtitles, A Business Owner's Guide to Building a Lead Generating, Sales Driving, Money Making Direct Mail Campaign. Craig, thank you so much for joining me and taking the time. My pleasure, glad to be with you. Thanks for inviting me today. And I'm excited to hear your big lessons mistakes you learned in your journey of success, what works, what doesn't work, and it kind of goes into, I always ask about a fun fact, and you were telling me a fun fact about you was about your largest direct mail that you sent out. Tell me, tell us about that. Yeah, so, you know, um, well, we were talking fun facts, and I was saying, hey, I'm an ordinary guy, I play basketball, I run, I just do, you know, three kids, I coach soccer, so I was trying to think of something that might be interesting to those listening today or watching this, so uh, really my fun fact has to do with the largest direct mail campaign that I sent out. Um, it was just over 5.7 million pieces of mail, wow. and the, the reason it was so, so interesting was because when you do a mailing of that size, and it was actually a 72-page digest booklet, so it's if you think of Reader's Digest, it's that size, 72 pages long, and I mailed out 5.7 million. And so when you're dealing with something like that, you just can't call up the printer and say, "Hey, I want to drop uh, you know 5.7 million pieces of mail tomorrow." I mean, there's a lot that goes into it, and I had to uh, get paper from a mill mill in the state of Washington and have it shipped by rail, by train, all the way down to Los Angeles. And it took 36 boxcars full of big rolls of paper in order to fulfill this one, this one large mailing that we were doing. So uh, there's my fun fact. Largest campaign I did was 5.7 million pieces of mail. That's amazing. So what was the direct mail for? It was for, uh, was for a company I was working for. It was one of the ways I got my start, but it was the Ken Roberts Company. Uh, they were a large financial publisher, and it was selling a course on uh, how to trade commodities. So, so obviously you have to build up to 5.7 million. Where did that campaign start? I mean, were you doing test runs for it? How did it begin? Right, so we, we were mailing uh, super aggressively. This seems like everything, fortunately, everything we were mailing seemed to be working. We had great copy. We knew exactly what our customers looked like. And since we knew who they were, I could go and find prospects that looked just like them. So we had this surplus of people we could mail to. And, it, you know, it all starts out with something small. You know, we, for them being a large publisher, small mailing was 50,000 pieces. Um, for other businesses, that may be 3,000 pieces or 5,000 pieces of mail. But for the publisher, 5,000 or 50,000 pieces was a small mailing. So as we'd see success, we would go a little bit more. Maybe we'd do 100,000, and then we'd do 200,000 and 300,000, and not only work our way up in quantity, but we'd also work our way up in frequency. So we may start out with a mailing once a month. Well, it got to the point where we're sending a mailing out almost every single week of the year wow. and increasing the volume with every mailing until we got to the point where we were able to do 5.7 million pieces of mail, and it was phenomenal. What does success look like when you say it was a success for Great someone question. who doesn't know as much? What does it look like? Yeah, you know, one of the things with direct mail marketing that a lot of people um, don't quite understand is is the the money behind it and how does that all work? You know, when we were mailing out 5.7 million pieces of mail, we actually took a loss on the front end. Uh, we were selling a course for $197, um, and and it cost us about $225 to $250 to acquire those customers. And so a lot of people look at it and say, well, why would you do that? But it was the back-end sales. Um, we would sell other courses and newsletters and subscription services that over the course of time, uh, we would have a lifetime value of each customer that would be $700, $800, $900 and up for the average customer. Mm -hmm. So for us, we were willing to pay $225, $250 on the front end 
take a loss, knowing that months down the road that customer would be worth nine hundred dollars to us. Yeah, I mean you could spend up to whatever you know seven hundred, eight hundred dollars mm -hmm. if you wanted to. Yeah, I mean there was times when we were spending three hundred fifty, four hundred dollars to acquire customers because we were making so much money on the back end, and it just goes back to you know what are you willing to spend to acquire a customer, and in this case because we had a great lifetime value, we could spend a lot of money and that's how you can mail, you know, 5.7 million pieces of mail. Yeah. And so for Craig, people out there who, you know, may be thinking, I don't even know what it costs me to acquire a customer. You know, obviously if you know that, you know how much you could actually spend. How did they, you know, what's the best maybe quick and dirty way for someone to figure that out if they haven't even thought about the first step? Well, I think it's to figure out. Um, well, there's just a lot to that one question. Just so you yeah. know, I mean, we've got to, yeah. you know, it's a loaded question. It, yeah, <laughs> who, who is it you're mailing to? You know, is it uh, is it a, a group of consumers? If you're doing business to consumer marketing, it's much easier to get a higher response rate than if you're doing business to business marketing. Business to business marketing, when you're mailing to a CEO or a, a purchasing manager or somebody at a company, they're already saturated with a lot of things. Um, you know, with a lot of other mail, emails, phone calls. So when you're going into that environment, your response rates tend to be a little bit lower. If you're going to consumers and you're getting into their mailbox, there's less distractions, so you have a better chance of a higher response mm -hmm. rate. So you need to look at who is it that you want to mail to first and what is it you're going to mail them. If you are trying to drive them to a website, you could probably get away with just mailing uh, an oversized postcard. And if you do that, you can back out the cost, what it costs to print and mail it. And from there, you can kind of estimate your response rate and figure out, okay, based on printing and postage and list rental, it's costing me X amount of dollars. I think I'm going to get this many people in the door. So therefore, you know, our estimated cost per acquisition is this. Yeah, yeah. That, and that's so important. And, you know, with that, when you send that, that piece out, what is a decent response? Uh, if you're going for, say you're driving customers online, which is a big thing, you know, I send out almost 300 millions a year, and, and right now about 100 of them or more, right around there, is they're all um, driving offline, direct mail, to online uh, video sales letter, opt-in pages, landing pages, you name it. So we're taking offline to online. Mm -hmm. So about one-third of the mailings I do right now are for clients who want to get more people online. Um, the formats that I'm finding work best for that are postcards and um, four-page self-mailers. Uh, four-page self-mailers is simply a, a sheet of 11 by 17 paper folded down twice. Basically folds to 8.5 by 5.5, which gives you, uh, you know, a lot more real estate to write copy, uh, but it costs the same for postage as an oversized postcard does. Mm -hmm. So um, we're using that format to drive pros prospects online. Uh, the response rate, um, on average, is about three to five percent opt-in rate. Mm -hmm. So, three for, if you're mailing, uh, you know, a thousand pieces, you're going to have three to five percent, thirty to fifty of those actually opting in. The next step, depending on the price point, once they've opted in and they watch your video sales letter or read your sales letter online or watch your webinar, we're seeing anywhere from five to ten percent of those people convert into buyers. Wow. Um, in some cases, the opt-in rate's a little lower, and in some cases, the opt-in rate's a little higher, and the same with conversions. Yeah. I've seen conversion rates all the way up to 17%. It just depends on how good the sales material is and how qualified a prospects we're driving there. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of ifs along the way, which I think we'll talk about, because I yes. know <laughs> you write several articles for entrepreneur.com, um, too, and I was reading through some of those. I mean, you could anywhere from the copy to the list to, I mean, there's so many factors that are involved. That's why we have you. Um, but I want to back up and find out where this all came from and where you started. Sure. Um, tell me, tell us a little bit about where did you grow up? What was, what was your childhood like? What influenced you early on? Um, well, you know, I'm, I'm an ordinary Beaver Cleaver family, you know, uh, we, I have nothing exciting uh, that really to, to share as far as my life goes. I mean, I have a brother and I grew up playing sports and, you know, my heroes at the time were Larry Bird from, uh, from the Boston Celtics and Joe Montana, the 49ers. And, mm -hmm. you know, I enjoyed watching those guys on TV and seeing their drive and their 
relentless, you know. Um, you and I were talking just before we got started today, and we are talking about how both of us love to play basketball. And, and I'm at the age now of playing basketball when Larry Bird was just finishing out his career. And in, in watching the guy dive all over the court when he can barely walk after a game, you know, he never gave up. I mean, he was relentless. And, yeah. and me, at that age, I'm, I'm careful. I'm trying not to get hurt. I'm trying to leave the court that day without an injury. So um, growing up, I just, I loved sports, watched basketball, and played basketball. Did you have a business mentor, or who'd you look, look up to that way? Because obviously you went into the business realm. Yeah, you know, I'll tell you how I got started in direct mail. It's really uh, a unique way. I got into rock climbing as I got older, and I built this 20-foot high rock climbing wall in my backyard. And after I had built this thing, I, I didn't have any money left to buy the holds that you bolt onto the wall that you climb up. Yeah, yeah. So I, here I am, 19 years old, 18 years old, don't have the money to buy these things, but I built this big old wall. So I started messing around, and I found a little formula that I could make these fake rock climbing holds that you could bolt on the wall and climb up it. And so my buddies came over after I'd made them and climbed up it and said, man, those are, those are great. We should, you should try selling these. So I went into business for myself at 19 selling these fake rocks. And uh, I did my first direct mail campaign, and I sent out 250 pieces and sat by the phone thinking, this thing's going to ring off the hook. I'm going to get you know, tons of orders. And it didn't ring one time. It completely bombed. My first mail came, campaign did not bring a single. What did you piece. send? What did you send out for the first? I one? sent a number ten envelope, plain white envelope, handwritten address, and then a really bad letter on the inside. It was like two or three paragraphs, if that, saying, you know, please buy my rock holds. Here they are. You know, here's here's a picture of them. I mean, it was awful. That's pretty good for a 19-year-old. Though, what made you decide to even do direct mail at that time? You know, it was just, I guess it was just kind of a guess that, hey, this should try. I didn't have money to do TV, didn't have money to do radio, and I knew, I did know at least enough that I had to go after a group of rock climbers, so I knew I had to go after a targeted universe, and the only way I could figure out how would be with uh, either print advertising or direct mail. But over time, I, I ended up working at it, and I got to the point where over the course of a couple years, I sold over 4,000 rocks through direct mail. That's awesome. So that got my start into the direct mail business, and I loved the marketing side. But when the phone would ring and I knew it was an order, my stomach would turn because that means I had to go out in the garage and my sweatshop, and I had to and I had to make these holes. So I hated the manufacturing side of it, but loved the marketing side. So I sold that business, and then I went to work for a large financial publisher, the Ken Roberts Company, and took you know took what I had known in direct mail and that, that company helped take me to the next level learning a whole bunch, a whole bunch more about it and, and that's how I got my start. What was, what was working? Obviously the first mail you sent out you got no response. What uh, then works? You could sell 4,000 of them. Well, it really had to do with um, the way I positioned the copy, the offer, um, the pricing. Uh, there, you know, the first one was really just buy my holds. I mean, I didn't know what I was doing. Just buy my holds and here's, you know, here's a picture of them. But then I had to tell the benefits of them. I had to tell how they feel, they feel like real rock. I had to include testimonials. I had to give examples for uses of them. Talk about how they're versatile. versatile. They could change them different directions and use them different ways. I talk about how, how they were indestructible. Um, because the big thing in that business was these things would break on you. So money would fall yeah. over, they would not break. So I had to tell all the benefits of it instead of the instead of just talk, say, hey, buy it. I, that didn't work. I had to tell some things about it in order to get people to buy. So what was one of the big takeaways? So after that, you went to the Ken Roberts. What, what was the big takeaway you got from, from working there? I worked for, for Ken uh, Roberts for about 10, 10 or 11 years, and we became one of the, the world's largest financial publishers. Worth Magazine credited Ken on educating more people how to trade commodities than anyone else in the world. Wow. Uh, we had sold over 700,000 courses at $195 each. So it's a, it was a big business. Yeah, wow. My, my takeaway was when I left that business and Ken was retiring and I went out on my own, this was about, uh, about eight years ago, and I started doing full-time direct mail consulting, I realized, I thought that everyone knew what we knew at the company as far as how to, how to use direct mail to sell courses and newsletters and products and services. I thought everyone knew about lifetime value and how to incorporate that into the mailing. I thought it was just common knowledge amongst marketers. 
And I got out there and I started consulting with companies and really realizing that they didn't have a clue. They just thought that they could sell using features instead of benefits. They thought that short copy worked better than long. I mean, there's just a, a, a too many things to mention where I realized that, oh, wow, we really, I really had something here. I really didn't know that others didn't know some of these things. What made you decide to then branch out on your own? Well, um, really it was I was ready to do something else. I had sold you know, hundreds of thousands of courses, and I still have a good relationship with the owner, Ken Roberts. He, he's retired now, um, and I email with him probably uh, once a quarter and talk with him maybe once a year, but it was just time to move on, and I was getting... I was also getting phone calls from other people saying, hey, Craig, can you come do what you're doing for Ken for us too? So I already had a group of, of clients wanting to, to do business with me, and I thought, hey, I can take this to a new level, branch out into new areas. And so I said, let's, let's go for it. So I made the jump and, and went out on my own. So what's some of the great advice Ken's given you throughout the years? Oh, boy. Um, you know, really selling uh, selling based on benefits and selling based on story. He was a phenomenal storyteller. Um, he could get in front of an audience and just talk all day long and tell stories. And if you read the sales copy, the reason why it was 72 pages was because he was telling a story. Mm -hmm. And it's just amazing how telling a great story can connect with the prospects and then get that prospect, move them, and excite them enough that they want to then take the next step and buy your, your course. So talking about that, and then also talking about the benefits and not the features. You know, it's, it's not uncommon for um, marketing pieces to be sent out where somebody's so excited about the features of their product and service. Yeah, give me an example of where someone made a mistake with this. What's that? I could see that being a common mistake. What's an example of someone who made a, a mistake more features than, than benefits. Like, sure. What does that look like? I was, I was working with a company called Reg Online. They're an event software company. When I first started working with them, they were mailing a, a, a postcard. And it was, it was basically, you know, big on visuals, um, not a lot of copy. And it was just saying things like, this will be easy. We've got great email platform. We make it so that you're, you know, we have great processing features. And it was all about the features of the product. And I changed them, and they were mailing about 20,000 pieces a year. I changed them over to a long-form sales letter that was 16 pages long and focused on all the benefits. And I talked about how it could save them time, how it could save them money, how it, you know, all the things that it could do for them benefit-oriented, not features-oriented. And we got to the point where we were mailing over 800,000 pieces a year. So started out 20,000. Over time, we built up to mailing over 800,000 pieces a year for many years, changing from features to benefits. I could see, even with your track record, people giving you pushback with you saying, we're going to go to a 17-page letter. Do they give you pushback, or they just say, oh, that's, uh, we trust oh, you. Yeah, no, that, go with it. The, 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 the most common phrase is, well, I would never read this. It's too long. And, and, you know, it's, I just have to tell them, I have done thousands of tests. And I've done hundreds of tests that just focus on long copy versus short copy. And I have only seen one occasion where short copy worked better. So it's, it's really, really rare. And, and the one time that it actually worked better, I don't think that the stats were right that the client was giving me. So I was going <laughs> off of their database, and I think some things got confused, but They're I They're trying remember. to prove their point, right? Yeah. yeah. So... So yeah, I'm always seeing that long copy works much better, and it's it's something people fight against for sure. Yeah. So Craig, what's been a memorable campaign when you branched out on your own? What's been a memorable campaign for you with a client? I would say one of them is um, for a pet food store company called Pet Supplies Plus. I've got this great client; he owns 20 pet food stores. And when I started working with him, you know, I had never mailed for pet food stores. I I, I I'd never done anything like that, and so. Um, the first mailing, I was really nervous. I was confident in the list. I was confident in the copy, but it was a niche I'd never mailed into. And I thought, can we get affluent buyers? Because we didn't want any kind of buyer. We didn't want Groupon people. We wanted affluent female buyers who would buy over and over again. And so I was hoping that campaign would work out, and it, it was a tremendous success. And so that was like three years ago, and we've been mailing every month since then. 
And so it was a memorable one because it was a new niche, and it was one of those times where I realized, yeah, this direct mail can work in other niches. It's not just the traditional ones, I think. We can actually turn a profit going into retail pet, fo pet food stores. So that was one of my more exciting campaigns to me. How do you decide what to mail in those situations? I mean, you can mail, like you were saying, an envelope, a postcard. What, what makes you decide what to mail? Well, it starts a lot with the prospect and what they look like um, and what it is and what we're trying to accomplish. If we're driving somebody to a web page, I don't need a 12-page sales letter to get them to go online. Um, it would work, but it's a bit of an overkill. So I try and match up with what is the offer and what am I trying to do. If I'm trying to sell a $1,200 medical procedure, um, I'm not going to do it with a postcard. I've got to actually um, mail a longer letter, tell a story, give the reasons, give the benefits, and then I can convert them. So it really starts with what is the message that I'm trying to get across. If it's a simple one, hey, go into the store to, re you know, to redeem this coupon or go in the store to buy this, I can do that in four pages. Do I need 12? No. Would 12 work better? Probably, but the cost would probably offset it. So there's the balance between um, how long a copy you should use. And is it necessary? So is it necessary for a 12-page letter to go online? No, it's not. So we do a shorter copy. So what do you decide for the pet in the pet uh, example? I use what's called a, a four-page self-mailer, and that's the one I described in the beginning where it's a sheet of 11 by 17 paper folded down. And I use that for a lot. You know, an interesting thing, um, I'm selling face cream for Beachbody, who has the P90X and Insanity. And the, the pet food store is going after people who, women, who have an income of 75000 or more, and they're older women. Well, the Beachbody face cream, Germ Exclusive, we're going after women who are older women, who are affluent. And so the interesting thing, I'm selling pet food, you know, through a four-page self-mailer. I do that selling face cream as well, and it works equally as well. And so it's one of those things that I'm saying, okay, this style of piece works very well to females of a certain age and income level. Yeah. So knowing those things about different characteristics, about different, different markets that I'm going into, I'm able to select the type of piece that I know works best to that, to that group. Mm -hmm. So what's another memorable piece that you uh, look back on and uh, revel in? I think uh, the, the first time I mailed a tear sheet, you know what a tear sheet is? It's, uh, I don't know. A tear sheet's like a, if you were to take a newspaper article that you saw and you were going to send it to a buddy, you rip it out of the newspaper and you fold it up, you put a post-it note and you say, hey, Jeremy, I thought you might be interested in this, and you stuff it in the envelope and you mail it off. That one was a pleasant surprise the first time I mailed it because I had the first time I did that was about four, four or five years ago, and I, I didn't think it was going to work. And we did it all right. We did the newspaper. We made it look just like a real newspaper. It had the same newsprint on it, same thin paper. We had a, a, one edge ripped, so it looked like it was actually ripped out of the, the newspaper. <laughs> And we put it in a little tiny green envelope, about seven and a half inches wide. And it was green, and we had a handwritten address. And we didn't put a return address on it. We just put a handwritten address with a live stamp, stuffed it in there with a post-it note saying, hey, Jeremy, thought you might be interested in this. And the response rate was incredible. I think we got like a 2% response rate on it. It was phenomenal. So that was a really memorable, exciting mailing, too. What was it for? Um, that one there was actually, the first one I did was actually with um, Frank Kern, and he was doing a, a mailing to dentists to get them in for a um, free strategy session. Got it. And you mentioned two things with the, the pet supplies, which is the list and the copy. Mm -hmm. And you had those in place. Where do people start with a list, and, and then obviously I want to pick your brain on how do you find a good copywriter? Great. I, I can talk a bit about list. If I'm going into too much detail or you have more questions, let me Never know. Never too much detail. Okay, good. <laughs> these are, I mean, these are real tips. I mean, when I'm talking to, when I get phone calls, one of the most common questions I get asked is about the mailing list. So, yeah. and it is, it's so important to get the list right because if you don't get the list right, you're not going to be able to, you're not going to be successful in the campaign. So one thing I really encourage people to do is to work with a list broker. Um, and a list broker is a lot like a real estate agent. 
they, um, if you go into my hometown of Grants Pass, Oregon, and you want to buy a piece of real estate, you can go to the list to the real estate broker and say, "Hey, show me this house," and they can show you any house in the market, and then they can arrange for you to purchase that house. And when you purchase it, they're not paid by you; they're paid by the seller. Well, in the list business, it's very similar. You can go, and a list broker can show you any list on the market, and there's you know well over 100,000 lists on the market. And the broker can then coordinate you renting that list. Now you don't pay them for the service; the list owner is actually paying them. So it's really it's a free service for you to go and use a list broker to rent mailing lists. So the best starting point for any list is to use a list broker. <clears throat> now when you go to them, you're going to need to give them an example of who it is you're looking for. If you're looking for you know, men 50 plus, you need to be specific about it. You don't want to just say, I want males 50 plus because there's millions and millions and millions of males in that category. You need to say, well, they have an income of this, this is their hobby, this is your interest. So the more you know about your existing customers and their age, income, hobbies, and interests, the more information you have when you go to your list broker to say, here are all the details about my best clients, Help me find customers that look just like them. Yeah. And that's one of the, the biggest tips I can give about um, lists. I can talk about response-based list and compiled list if you want, or we can move on. What, I have a question about the list broker. So where do you find a list broker? Um, well, there's, I mean, there's like a lot of list brokers out there. I mean, but I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear oh, you. Oh, God, I said, you know, like real estate, they have big companies, but where do you go to find a, a list broker? Well, my, I can tell you my favorite list broker is Macromark, M-A-C-R-O-M-A-R-K, macromark.com. I've used them for almost 20 years. Um, but as far as other list brokers out there, there's a lot of them. And if you're in a big town like yours, like Chicago, there's probably a list broker in there, and you can go and sit down in their office, and like any vendor, you want to get to know them. You want to see if they're going to work the same way that you would work. If you're a guy that only likes to use the phone and no email, then you make sure they're willing to work that way. Or if you're someone who only wants to do faxes, <laughs> you know, make sure they're willing to do that. So you'd interview them like any vendor, and then they kind of partner up with you because they want to see you succeed. They want to get you the best list in most cases so that you'll come back and be a client that they, they have for a long time. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And so after that, you said, do you want to get into, you said compiled, what did you say? Compiled list versus response list. Yeah. So I've stopped counting the number of pieces I've mailed. I know that it's over 200 million, but I know that of those, 95% of the lists I've mailed have been what's called a response-based list. So my son, he, he, when we're watching TV, if he sees the Sleep Number Bed commercial come on, um, are you familiar with Sleep Number Bed? Have you seen those commercials? Yeah. Where the people are taking the control and they're raising it up and lowering it down? Well, my son, who's nine, you know, after seeing those commercials, he's like, Dad, my back hurts. I'm not comfortable when I sleep. I need one of those sleep number beds. And uh, he's convinced that he needs this, you know, electronic bed. And he really likes the idea of the controls and all that stuff. Well, if he picked up the phone and he called the 800 number on that commercial, he would be considered an inquiry. And he responded to a direct response campaign. So, therefore, he's an inquiry for the sleep number bed. Well, if they were to make their list available, you could go and rent what's called a response-based list, which is made up of inquiries. Now, the reason why that's important is because if you're going to do a mailing, it's better to mail to somebody who has responded to a prior direct re response campaign versus somebody who has not. If I were to go out and get a group of dentists, there's a group of dentists who are on a compiled list where they haven't responded to anything, mm -hmm. they were just put on that list because they have a certain title or degree or belong to a certain association. Well, if you mail them, there's no prior history as to whether or not they're going to respond to a campaign. Whereas if you get a group of dentists who have responded to an investment newsletter offer, well then, now you've got some, some more information on them knowing that they are responsive. So when you look at what type of list to mail, I prefer to mail a response-based list. There are times when a compiled list of like dentists might work better, but in most cases a response-based list is the one to go with. 
And there are a couple different types of response-based lists. There's the inquiry, like my son, if he called for sleep number bed. There's the buyer's list, where if you physically go and purchase something through the mail. There's seminar attendees lists. Um, and so those are kind of a couple of the key um, response-based lists. Yeah. Um, let me throw one other thing. The compiled list, though, there are advantages to it, too. So why would, you, yeah, why would even someone get a compiled list? It sounds like a no-brainer, like you'd want the response list and never want to touch a compiled list. Exactly. So here's a, here's a good example of uh, if you were a dating service and you were trying to mail to um, do recently divorced men of a certain income level, well, you might not. there's not going to be a buyer's list for recently divorced men. And there's nothing out there that shows that they're recently divorced. So, like a returned it, wedding ring or something? No. Yeah, yeah, the, the returned wedding ring uh, service. I mean, there's not one out there. So, you know, if there was, it'd be a great list to rent. But if you wanted to find men of a certain age who were single, who were recently divorced, um, had a certain income level, those are the types of lists that you would go after and use compiled because it's gathered data from government sources, credit data. Um, surveys, different things like that, and puts them on a compiled list. So, yeah. oftentimes with compiled, you can get more characteristics, demographics, and psychographics about a, a person because if it's all compiled and put together, and you can find out different bits of information about them. Whereas a buyer's list, you don't know if they're recently divorced or not. You just know that they have a habit or a hobby or an interest that they're buying. So, if you're going to buy if you're selling golf clubs through the mail, well, you're going to want to find other golf buyers. But if you're looking for recently divorced men of a certain income level, you're going to need to go to a compiled list and find somebody who's recently divorced of that income. Does that, does that make sense and help kind of explain it? Makes perfect sense. Yeah. Oh, and like, as you explain this, Craig, it seems like like the sky's the limit. I mean, you have a good product, you put together a good offer, and you target it really specifically. You know, you're getting really laser focused. What is a big mistake people make? I'm glad you asked that because that there there is one mistake that a lot of them make, and there's a couple. But um, can I give two? <laughs> yeah, give as two. many as you want. One <laughs> is, you know, with the business that I'm in, I find that a lot of companies want you to step up to home plate, and they're going to throw the ball, and they want you to hit a home run the first time out. And anybody who plays any sport knows that that's tough to do on the first time out. And that's the same with marketing. To get your copy exactly right, your offer perfect, the list dialed in on your first mailing is tough. Now, we're able to take past experience and do it occasionally, but more time than not, it may take one or two or three campaigns to dial in exactly that direct mail system you can use over and over again. Yeah. When I talked about Ken Roberts and mailing 5.7 million pieces of mail, you know, his first couple of mailings were not huge successes. He had to keep tweaking. And, and changing things until we found out what worked and what didn't. So a big mistake for mailers, and if you're going to go out and do a mailing on your own, is don't give up after the first try. Make sure you have a couple different tests in there so you can learn things about the mailing, learn what lists are working best, learn what type of copy is working best. Because once you develop that system, you can use it over and over again. So if you miss out on that and try and hit a home run the first time out, you're really setting yourself up for failure. So that's no, one that is a good one. That is a good one. Good. Uh, number two is not calculating in the customer value into your mail campaign. So let's say you're a dry cleaning business and you're going to do this mailing and you're going to evaluate the success of the mailing based on how many customers you get. And let's say you get 10 new customers who spend $39 with you. Well, if you look at that $10, 10, 10 customers times $39, you're probably going to look at the total revenue and say, wow, this million was a dud. I spent more money on printing and postage than I got in return. But if you look at the long-term value of those customers and you see that over time, those 10 customers spend on average $250 with you, all of a sudden, the details and the success of the mail campaign look significantly different. Yeah. So with your direct mail, you want to incorporate the long-term value of your customer to help determine its success. Don't base it on that initial sale. Base it on how much money you're going to make from them over a period of time. Yeah, that's a good point. And it goes into actually following the details, you know, and kind of knowing what that 
you know, your acquisition costs and lifetime value costs, and even if someone refers someone, I feel like people just don't do that. Yeah, I mean, it's important to, I mean, with, with direct mail, it's an expensive medium to get into, but it's also extremely profitable. It's got great rollout potential. It can be extremely targeted. And so if you want it to work for you, you've got to make sure you're willing to know all those marketing numbers and details. It's not like you can just go spend $50 on Google AdWords and not worry about whether or not it works. Direct mail doesn't work that way. You've got, there's some science behind it. Right. You need to study it and make sure you do it right because if you do, you've got a source you can use over and over again for years and years and years. And if you just do it halfway and don't know your numbers, don't know your lifetime value numbers, don't know your response numbers, then you're just going to waste money. So you really have to be scientific with it and study it. That's a good point. And, and when you send out the first one, would you recommend just sending two versions or would you send three versions? How many versions yeah. would it be ideal? I, I like the idea of, of sending at least two versions for your first mailing and testing at least four different lists because you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. There's been times where I've done a mailing and the test mailing and only one out of four lists work. But that one list had other lists that were similar or just like it that we could then go to and mail more of those. So if I pick four lists, I may pick four slightly different types of lists. You know, that way, if one of them works, I can go and find others that are just like them. If I find that two or three of them work, then great, I've got even a bigger universe to go to. So I like testing two different types of sales pieces and multiple lists to see what's going to work and what doesn't. Yeah. And then do you have a general rule for budget? Like for someone who's just starting off, like do they take a percentage of what they normally sell? What what where should they start with the budget? No, I think it comes down to more of um the type of 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 mailer that you are. If you're a national mailer, I would say, you know, mailing to national places, I'd say at a bare minimum, bare minimum, you gotta mail at least ten thousand pieces, ten to fifteen thousand pieces. Because you have to have enough volume to get the response and be able to read it and make you know, evaluate it. Right. If you're a regional mailer, um, then I'm going to say three to 5,000 pieces of mail is, is necessary. If you're a really small neighborhood mailer, then you could probably get away with around you know, 500 to 1,000. So a lot of it depends on the area you're going to and uh, the type of offer you're presenting. And it's really more about quantity than it is about the overall price because if you're going business to business, you may only need to do a 300-piece mailing, but it may cost you a lot more um, because you're doing a, a, a big package or, or box of stuff versus going to consumers, uh, you know, offering a free pizza. You know, those are two different things, and they cost totally different. Yeah, yeah and so you mentioned the list, and the, the other thing was how do you choose a copywriter? Because that's an important component as well. Yeah, it is. And, you know, there, there are an increasing number of copywriters out there because it's a great stay-at-home business, right? You can learn how to write copy and work, from, work in your pajamas at your computer, you know. But because of that, you have to be extra careful. And what I like to do is I like to see samples of sales pieces that they've written. I want to read through those sales pieces. And particularly, I want to see what niches they've worked in. If I am um, doing a market, if I'm doing a campaign for a, a a real estate seminar offer, then I want to find a copywriter who's written in that niche before, and then um, or a niche that's very similar. And I want to read their copy, and I want to make sure that it's benefit-driven. You know that uh, that it, it connects with the with the prospect, that it's got a strong offer. You know, I'm looking for those things, and I think it's um, copywriters are one of those things that's worth paying a little bit more money for. It's better to have a seasoned pro write copy than somebody who's brand new. You really, when it comes to sales copy, you get what you pay for. So if you're, you know, find somebody on uh, Elance and they're $300 to write copy, and you're comparing them to somebody else who charges $3,000, well, you're going to get what you, really, you're going to get what you pay for, and I would go with the higher end one, especially if their service, their, their prior um, copy assignments match the market you're in. Yeah, and I also want to ask about your book, um, The yes. Direct Mail Solutions. I want to know how you came up, first of all, with the subtitle, because I like the copy on that. Yeah, I'd like to, I would like to tell you, and I, I, I'd like to tell you that I came up with that and, and it just came to me, but that wasn't really it. 
Um, it's published by Entrepreneur Magazine. And so the publisher has a lot of say in the title and design and all that stuff. So when they came to me, they actually gave me three suggestions. And that was one of them. And I liked it. And I said, perfect. And I thought they did an excellent job selecting the title and sub subtitle. So I didn't come up with it, but I love it because it really does describe what the book is all about. So what made you decide to, to write the book? Well, the biggest thing is, you know, I've been doing um, direct mail marketing for almost 20 years. And over the last eight, I've been doing, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of campaigns, thousands of campaigns. And, and the biggest thing is I get people calling me, a lot of small businesses, and they, they want tips and techniques for direct mail. And unfortunately, I, you know, I can't spend all day on the phone helping everyone with free advice. Yeah. So I spent actually the last three years writing all the material for it. And just giving every detail about how to successfully put together a direct mail campaign. Things that would save you thousands of dollars, things that could make you thousands of dollars, and all the techniques and things, tips and techniques to keep you from making a huge mistake. Yeah. And that way when people call, I can say, hey, you know, I've got this book, you can go buy it, and it's going to give you the A to Z, you know, here's how to put together a direct mail campaign. So that's the reason I wrote it, was really to help people. I mean, if you ever publish a book and you're working with a, a publisher, the author in most cases makes very little money. So I'm not maybe it's not a money maker for me. It really right. is to help people and, and to get the word out about direct mail. Yeah, I mean, if anyone reads the just the um, almost the different chapter, you know, I went through and I'm like, oh, I can't ask all these questions. All of them seem really interesting. Um, so I pulled out a few. You know, like chapter two, you talk about direct mail basics, which we talked a little bit about creating the perfect sales piece. Um, a common mistake people make, which you talked about. Chapter four, how do you use direct mail to drive traffic to your website and then back to your store? Is there? Um, I want to know what your one of your favorite stories is from the book. Um, you know, I, I think one of my favorites is when I, well, I love talking about lists because that's a huge part about what I do is I spend a significant amount of time researching lists. And one of the examples in the book is about a company called It's Just Lunch. And it's a dating service, but it's not your ordinary dating service. It's looking for affluent people who are looking for real relationships and who are mature. And so the research that went into that, I give an example. There's, I think, three, maybe three or four pages of examples on that one in the book. And it's showing the list that I had selected in the different categories I had selected in. And I love that part because it shows about segmenting a list. You know, if we were to go get Forbes magazine, I wasn't just going to select, oh, I want men from Forbes magazine. I went down to, I want to make sure that they're of a certain age level. I want to make sure that, that they're an active subscriber to it. And I broke it up by different categories. And to me, you know, I'm kind of a, a, a nerdy guy when it comes to, uh, to the science of direct mail. So for me, it's exciting to see how you can break down a list. When you first look at a list, you might think, oh, I'll just rent Forbes magazine. Well, there's more to it than that. You can get age. You can get, in some cases, income. You can get... So you can select whether they're single or not. And for a dating service, you want to make sure that they were single, you know. So that, to me, was one of the more, more interesting parts of the book that I enjoyed. So what's something that you were surprised when it came down to a certain segment that you mailed to and it correlated to a certain demographic? Well, was there anything that surprised you in the past? I, I can tell you something, just going off that story, something I tried to get, and I think I could, but I haven't been able to, I haven't gone far enough yet, but um, they wanted, for the dating service, they wanted, um, they had better success with taller men. And so really? what I wanted to do was work with some of the clothing um, companies and see if they, because you can rent a, a list of clothing buyers, who per, like men who have purchased pants, who are of in a certain age and income level, well, I wanted to go back to him and say, can you give me inseam size? Because if you could tell the inseam size of a man's pants, then I could get the clients, men who are over six feet tall, because that's who their best clients are. So I haven't taken that next step, but if I did, I think that would be a very cool segment to get. And, and I think it's one that's attainable if, if we really try. Yeah. No, I like that. Well, that is really interesting. Why was it that tall men is just what they found? Well, because they're not, they're not about, um, they really are about, uh, it's just lunch. They're about creating long-term relationships. And so they're, the females that they have signed up for it are attracted to more males who are taller. And so 
they really wanted males in their pipeline, you know, the people that, that they have available to date, because it would make their female uh, females more happier um, that are subscribing to their service as well. So that's why that's why there was the inseam size and Got the height that we were looking for. So you talked about some of the successful campaigns with the pet supplies and P90X. Are there any other um, specific factors that have been especially effective with the successful campaigns? Um, you mean different tips and things that work well? Yeah. Um, I would say, you know, every mar every niche has something unique. I, I would say um, if you're doing face cream, you want to do before and after shots. Um, you want If you're doing weight loss, obviously you want to do testimonials. If you're doing, uh, you know, real estate investment courses, you got to use big headlines and um, make big promises. Um, if you're trying to get somebody to respond to something and you want them to open the envelope now, uh, put a fake check in there and make it a win double window envelope so when you receive the mail piece, it looks like there's a real check inside. Um, there's the, the pressure sealed check, which I love, which has been really strong lately. and It's a, a check that's folded and then it's got perforations on the side. It's the kind that you get from the government a lot of times for a return check. And you have to perf off the side and then you open it up and it looks like there's a fake check inside and you've got a sales letter in there with it. So there's a lot of different tips. Um, if you're doing, if you're trying to sell a course, um, I like to use a long form digest sales piece, which is the six by nine version. It looks like a Reader's Digest. If I'm selling supplements, um, you know, for joint pain or back pain, I like to use a Magalog, which a Magalog is like a magazine. It's glossy, um, and uh, again, you have to use great testimonials and. And, and tell a great story and um, there's just a lot of those things that come into each campaign depending on niche but those are I mean they're all my favorites because I like every one that I do. <laughs> I can listen to you rattle those off for an hour. Just, like, <laughs> just keep going. I've got a lot of them. I, I, it's, it's what I do. It's what I enjoy and it's, so I'm, I'm like I'm this direct mail nerd because I love it you know so. What's some of your favorite um, you know you probably Clients attract you know attract you in the same industry. What are your, some of your favorite genres to work in? I like um, I've really you know this year I've been doing a lot with uh, this this uh, face cream market, and it's crazy. I'm I'm you know a male that's middle aged and I'm enjoying marketing to these older women. I don't know why, but I really like the face cream market. I think it's because one of those those markets where they're, the, the prospects are hungry for it, and so you get these great response rates and and high conversion rates. And so I'm excited about face cream right now. Uh, I'm also excited That's about. That's why your skin looks so. Is that why your skin looks so good? Yeah. You no, it? I don't use any of the product. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, I'm also excited about the seminar market. You know, seminars about um, were dead about two years ago. It was really hard to fill a seminar room, and in the last nine months. Um, seminar marketing has been coming back and we're able to fill meeting rooms again uh, with different types of mail pieces which is exciting because that opens up a new door again. Um, there was a, about a four or five year lull in the, the seminar marketing world and I'm not talking about going to your own herd um, of customers, I'm talking about getting new prospects in the room and that's opened up again. And that's really exciting because it gives businesses more opportunities to market their products and services. Yeah. So we've talked about what some of the stuff that is successful, what works. What's been a campaign that didn't do well that you kind of had to iterate on and why wasn't it as effective as you thought? Um, well, I'd like to say all my campaigns are successful. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously there's some that there are definitely struggles. And, and a lot of times those struggles just come from Hey, we only need we need to do more testing, you know. Um, so a lot of my frustrations are there. Is hey, we, we can't hit a home run every time the first time out of the gate. But I guess what was a big maybe a big pivot point where maybe you did okay and then you you tweaked a few things and then it really did well. Well, uh, um, well, let me tell you about a couple of things. So one, I have a, a financial mail and he wanted to do a postcard mailing, and. And I reluctantly, I made a mistake of letting him get a list. He had a list uh, from, that he had acquired through an online source. And he said, Craig, this is a great list. Let's mail it. And I should have, I should have said, no, let's, let's get one of my lists. But I went ahead and did it. 
and we ended up having 21% of the mail returned. Now, can you wow. imagine that? And it actually was helping this guy out, and this was early on, and I used my own address to help him out because he was off in New Ze he lived in New Zealand, and I was here in America, and so I said, hey, I'll just use my address on this thing. So every day, going to the mailbox and grabbing more return postcards. I mean, I had a box stack full of them. And it was a huge mistake, and it was a lesson learned that I'll never do again. It was just he had got this list that was great, you know, supposedly, from an online source, but, but, and I took his word at it. And, and you really have to, and it was just a lesson that you really have to do research on who you're actually mailing to. What is the original source of the list? Because you need to really research that. Um, I have another, I have uh, some friends who are direct mailers, and they had mailed for many years. And we were talking one day about direct mail, and I, 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 I mentioned to them about cleaning their list. And they said, well, what do you mean about cleaning your list? And I said, well, don't you do a merge purge and data hygiene? And they were like, well, what is that? And what I found out is they had done hundreds of mailings but never had their mailing list clean. And the cleaning process is where you remove duplicates, you take out any bad addresses, bad zip codes, and you um, do the national address correction, you know, NCOA, and you, you correct any addresses for people that have moved. Well, they had never done that. Well, they went and implemented imme immediately, and they told me um, they instantly saved $52,000 on their campaigns wow. by cleaning up the names because what they were doing is they were mailing duplicate pieces so now you're paying for printing and postage twice on some names. And they were mailing to people who had moved and not correcting the address. So they had a ton of waste in their campaigns. So by adding that one little element in, that mistake had cost them a lot of money the years prior. Oh, that's huge. What's another common question you get or, or big mistake that you find that people make? Um, the big ones are two... two too short of copy. They want to write, you know, really short sales piece. They want to focus on features and not benefits. They pick the wrong mailing list. They don't incorporate the lifetime value into their mail campaign. Um, you know, I, I think another interesting one is that if you are um, in a niche, a specific niche, and you don't make yourself the guru, that can really harm you. So, let's say, for for example, my pet supplier that I work with, we've positioned the owner as the guru. And we've made him the face that we put his picture in it, the letters from him. We make a very personal connection using the guru. And I think that whenever you're telling a story, whenever you're making an offer, you need to connect with that prospect. And if you have a face of the company doing that, you have a better chance of making a sale than if you make it a cold, you know, this is from XYZ company, but right. with no face or image to go with it. So you really need to be relational in your mail and have a guru be the, the main focus of it. Has there been any painful moments or low points? Um, I mean, I think, you know, I think every business has struggles. Um, for me, I've had um, some of my biggest struggles have been growing pains. Um, that's just that's a good problem. To... What's that? That's a good problem to have. It, it's a great problem. But you know, I'll tell you, the thing I've struggled with uh, most in the last couple of years is finding really finding good employees. I mean, I've got some great ones now, and we just hired another one. But the process of finding people who want to work today has been tougher and tougher, at least in my community. And that's tough as a business owner because you want to give this great service and you want to keep growing your business, but if you don't have the right people around you to do it, then it, 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 you've worked so hard to generate leads and inquiries, and if you can't fulfill on them, then you feel a little bit like a failure, like, wow, I did all this work, got all these people to call me, but now I can't fulfill because I don't have the staff around me to help me out. So those have been some growing pains over the years that I've really struggled with, but I'm hoping now, I think, I've, I, think I have the solution and, and only time will tell. <laughs> That's a good one, Craig, actually, because a lot of people have problems with hiring. What have you found out from you know, past hires that didn't work out, that what you do now in your process? You know, it's, it's funny. It's one of the things, whenever I'm uh, um, around in mastermind groups or talking to business owners, it's one of the things I've always asked is, do you have problems hiring good people? And everyone, just about everyone says yes. It's tough to find the right people. And I, you know, I wish I had the right answer for that. I, for me, it's just looking and looking and looking until you find them. But 
I don't have a good answer for you on how it, what, if there's a solution to it. Um, if you've got one, I would love to know, but I, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I wish there was an easy button for that. What's I guess a rule? You know, you find when someone doesn't work out, you write a rule in, like, okay, you know, don't ever look for the, you know, don't ever let sure. someone, you know, be on the internet during these hours or whatever it is. What's a rule you writ you wrote in because of a past employee who was just abusing? I, I, I wrote in. Um, that whenever I hire somebody, I want to know where they want to be now, a year from now, and five years from now. Um, mainly, not, not just as, as an employee, but more of where do they think, think they should be as far as pay. Um, and it was only because I had an employee come in and, and found out after six weeks of working for him that he wanted a $10,000 raise, and that would just be the start, you know, start of a much bigger raise that he wanted. And had I asked that question in the beginning, I could have curbed it. Because then I can see if the person I'm hiring has realistic views on where they should be now, next yeah. year, and five years from now. And uh, if they do, you know, I'm, I'm more than willing to pay an employee well, but they've also got to get there. You know, they can't arrive at a high salary to start with, you know, and that's what a lot of people want. So that's the rule I've, I've added in. Do you have staff, do they have to be in-house? Um, or can they be remote? Well, um, the way I operate now is I have one remote, one in-house, and then another guy's part part-time. That's remote as well. But I just actually am purchasing an office building. Hope to close on it this week, so I'm, gonna re I'm in the process of closing on it and then remodeling it. And so hopefully four to six weeks we'll all be in the same office. Congratulations. So, That's great. Yeah, thank you. So, Craig, what's been a proud accomplishment? You know, we talked about, obviously, like, hiring is an issue for, for most people yeah. at some point. What's been a proud one for you? I think the, the for sure, the pinnacle has been for me is um, writing the direct mail solution and getting a publisher to publish it. Um, you know, I know I could self-publish, but I, I really wanted to get a publisher to do it. And so, to me, that was a, a highlight, you know, a highlight to be able to write a book that somebody else is willing to pay to put into print and help pay the market. I'm, I'm excited about that and it's just an honor that they considered me and that they they were willing to invest time and money into me to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm super excited. And you know, probably of all the business ventures I've done, that's probably the one I'll make the least money on. In fact, I'll spend more money than I'll make on it. But um, I'm glad that I did it. I'm proud of it. So what about um, some of your mentors? I know you talked about Ken. Do you have any other mentors that you yeah. You know, I spend, um, I'm in uh, Dan Kennedy's mastermind group. I spend a lot of time with him throughout the year, work on different private clients with him. He by far is one of those that I've, I've learned a ton from. I mean, when it comes to business stuff, he's been um, phenomenal helping me. You know, one of the things is like, you know, keeping my focus. There's a lot of times where I want to expand out and go into new areas um, where he's kind of pulling back the reins and saying, hey, focus on what you got. It's really good just expand on what you got but don't try and go into new areas and and I've seen that actually happen with clients of mine where they're doing really good in a niche and all of a sudden they jump ship and they go into a different niche um, in fact uh, Ken Roberts did that he was very focused in the financial area and then he wanted to go into um, the public speaking and motivational area and we started selling products there and they completely bombed cost us millions of dollars and it was just because he got away from what he was really good at. Yeah. Now, it wasn't that it was a bad product, it just wasn't him. And so those are the kind of things that I try and stick to and say, you know what, I, I'm not a guy that's good at online marketing, so I'm going to stay away from it. You know, I'm going to focus on what I'm good at and just stick with direct mail and keep that my primary focus. That is a good tip because especially as entrepreneurs, especially with you're working with so many different types of businesses, focus can be an issue. You, know, totally. you just need, and so having that mentor to keep you on track, say, you know, Craig, don't do that, is probably uh, probably it's helpful. Super helpful. Yeah, totally, super helpful. So, what about? Um, I want to find out, Craig, from you, what in your daily rituals that you do that is like in a typical day that you find to be, you know, allow you to be most productive. Well, um, I try and schedule all my calls for Tuesday and Thursday. So this is a Tuesday when we're talking here. Um, and I, I, I don't always stick to that, but most of the time I do. And when I do, I find that I'm more efficient because of 
on my Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, I can, you know, not have to deal with the phone. I can really focus on production and work and projects. Um, and then I also, I also try and just keep a schedule outline. Okay, here are the things that I want to accomplish today. And by getting those things, you know, prioritized and what's the highest priority, the lowest priority, I'm able to be more efficient with my time. Um, I'm a big list guy. I have lists constantly going. I have a list every day. And you segment and, those lists. Oh, no. yes. <laughs> yeah, I do. I segment those lists of lists that I have to do. Um, and, and if I don't have a list, my list isn't crossed off at the end of the day. I don't sleep real well at night. So I'm really big on making sure I get all my stuff done that day. Right. Craig, I want you to talk, tell people um, where they can find you, the website, and what you're working on now that you're most excited about. And I want you to talk about when someone comes on board and hires you, how that process works. I've been holding back this question the whole time because I'm really wondering when someone comes on board, what, is that, what does that look like for the business owner? Okay, so let me see if I can answer. Uh, there's a couple of questions that I'll try to yeah. answer all of them. So um, uh, let's see here. So what does where it look like when somebody you? comes on? What was the first one? Where they find you. Where, tell people where, uh, where they can find you in okay. your business. So two places that you can find me. One is my website, which is simpson-direct.com, which I believe is on the bottom of the screen. Um, and then the other place is the directmailbook.com, the directmailbook.com, and that's a place where you can go and you can order my book. It gives a couple different resources for it, and if you order the book, it also gives an opportunity to get some free newsletters from me. So um, I hope everyone takes advantage of that. So those are the two places to find me: simpson-direct.com and the directmailbook.com. Yeah. And then um, as far as you know. What, the, what it looks like when I, I work with a pri what I call a private client. They basically become you know, part of our family and we become their marketing managers when it comes to direct mail and we coordinate um, the copy and design so that means that we will work with selected copywriters, the ones that we think are the best um, to make sure you get the best sales piece put together. So we work with copywriters, we work with designers and these are all top notch uh, men and women that we work with because we're doing hundreds of campaigns every year. We have to use the best. Um, and then we will do the research and select the, the mailing list as well as coordinate getting those mailing lists. We work with printers and we coordinate the printing and mailing of the campaign. And then we have the client report back to us. Here are all the people that responded from the mail campaign and now we go ahead and track it. We put together tracking reports to show what lists work, what sales piece work, and then make the recommendation of, of here's what we what we should do next. So it's A to Z, everything from the initial strategy all the way to tracking the campaign and, and planning the next ones. Is there a certain size business that you know to qualify? Um, well, I like them to have a bank account that has checks that cash, so uh, that we can deposit. <laughs> um, most of our company, most of our clients are in the three million on on up. Um, range. Uh, you know, I have some companies, you know, that spend over $100 million a year in advertising like Beachbody and others that gross over $100 million a year. But those are the big ones. But we work with anybody that's, um, you know, anybody who's serious about direct mail, we're willing to work with. I mean, they don't have to make $3 million a year to work with us. Yeah. But that seems to be the starting point for most of our private clients. Yeah. I didn't know if there was like a certain, oh, it's like a, usually a five-person company or 10-person company or 20-person company. So oh, as far as that, no, you know, yeah. Um, you know, I work with Dan, and he's a one-person company essentially. So, <laughs> Dan Kennedy. So, I mean, it's it's it can be it can be employee size doesn't really matter. It's more about sales volume. Yeah. And so, um, what are you working on now that you're most excited about? Um, well, you know, I'm still. Um, it's my personal project of the book right now. It's still my, my most excited thing. The thing I'm most excited about. I mean, I just launched a few months months ago, so I'm really trying to push to sell. You know, as many copies as I can and get the word out. So I'm doing things, you know, doing lots of webinars and teleseminars and, um, you know, those kind of things to really promote the book. That's what I'm most excited about. Obviously, I've got a whole uh, a, a group of clients that I'm working with that I'm excited with working, whether it's doing seminar offers or selling face cream or getting customers into retail stores or getting people to go to their dentist or whatnot. I mean, we, we're, I'm excited about all those projects. And you have a course on your site too, right? Yes. Like a direct mail course. It's uh, the million. Uh, yes, uh, yes, it is, and, and um, 
the course is actually very similar to the book. It's got a few extra components, um, and it's it's an excellent how-to, step-by-step course on how to put together a direct mail campaign. Yeah, yeah. People should definitely check it out. I think it's at Simpson-Direct.com/slash-million-dollar, right? Yep. Million dollar direct mail system is what it's yeah. called. Yeah. Um, last question for Greg, and I really appreciate your time. This has been super valuable. I can listen to you rattle off segmentation and and uh, success and what to do and what not to do all day. Um, my last question is about your your kids. So are they going to get in the direct mail business, or like what have you found because you're their dad that they're savvy on? Uh, well, they are um, six, seven, and nine. So. Um, I'm still trying to get the concept across to them of what direct mail is, you know. They'll say, Dad, did, did, you, did you mail this piece? And, you know, when we get the mail, and sometimes they'll be yes, and other times it's like, no, absolutely not. I did not have anything to do with that piece, you know. Um, but uh, I, I hope to get them in the business. Um, uh, I would love for them to, to get passionate about it and get involved, but uh, I'm not going to force them into it if they've got to have an interest there and they've still got a long way to go before they're ready. Like I'm wondering what their their rock story is gonna be when they're except when you were yeah. 19. I bet theirs is gonna be when they're like 11. They're gonna have some idea that you're gonna help them with. Well, I have some ideas for some school fundraisers that could be really fun uh, for using direct mail. So I think there'll be a, a campaign coming up for them in that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I wanted to end on Craig. What is the most fun, outrageous, shock and awe mailer that you've seen or mailed out? Hmm. Boy, there's been a bunch of them. Um, I've done flashlights and magnifying glasses and handcuffs and service bells and uh, aspirin and I've done everything. I've done all sorts of stuff. Handcuffs? Um, Should I even ask what the handcuffs were for? Or? Well, that was going to um, that was actually going to rural police stations. Okay. And so it was a sales letter in there for selling uh, handheld radios. Um, service bells was for hotels. Um, Boy, there's been a bunch. I can't think of one that was. Uh, there's, there's there's a whole bunch. They're all unique and different, and a lot of it has to do with the copy that goes with it. You know, like with the flashlight, it's here. Let us shine some light on this for you. You know, and you got the flashlight inside there. So there's been a, a, some a lot of those. Um, we've done some cool shock and awe packages where uh, one of my clients actually mails out a leather briefcase, and inside of it's got all these cool architectural stuff. He's a he's a builder, and so. You know, there's been there's been a lot of great packages, but I couldn't just pick one. Yeah, that's amazing. A leather briefcase. Well, it's a shock and awe package, so it's not going to prospects. It's going to those who have responded to a direct mail campaign, right. shown interest. Then a uh, eighty dollar briefcase is mailed out, along with a whole bunch of stuff inside. So yeah, um, and I was going to doctors, so the, there was an affluent group who would remember that piece and and hopefully become a client in the future. Yeah. Craig, I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone should check out the Direct Mail Solution. I believe it's on Amazon. Uh, any other places they can get it? Any other places they can get the book? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought you said I thought you were waiting for uh, something else there. Yeah, you can get it at the um, Barnes and Nobles, and you can get it at the DirectMailBook.com. Awesome. Thank you so much, Craig. It's been an absolute pleasure. I really appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.